No, YouTube isn't playing some weird, sick, super late April Fool's joke on you. This is a new episode just a few days after the previous one. You know, a lot of times I say that you're gonna love it, but uh, it's you can tell in my heart that I don't mean it. I mean, that last episode, what the fuck was that? Uh, if you haven't seen that one yet, uh, I'll link down below in the description box. Please check it out, it's really great. But this one, you are actually gonna love. I'm super excited to share it with you. I get into one of my favorite hands of all time, and uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited. So let's go ahead and get started. To most people in Las Vegas, this may just be another Saturday night. To me, it's different. As I'm heading into the Bellagio Poker Room to avenge my loss from the previous session that you might have seen in the last vlog, I'm way more excited than usual, and that's because... Today we're doing something that's on my poker bucket list. We're going to play in Bobby's room. So it's now called Legends Room, but uh, it's the most prestigious room in all of poker. It's where I've seen tons of high stakes players, Doyle Brunson, Gus Hansen, Svondiari, tons of guys like that in there all the time. And uh, they have the 510 must move in there. And uh, I heard about it, had to come down, had to get it on video. I was here yesterday, I lost 975, here today to try and get some back. I have no idea why the 510 is in what's formerly known as Bobby's room tonight, but I'm incredibly pumped up. I buy in for 1500, which is the max. I'm nervous as I'm heading in to take my seat. If you're not familiar, you might be wondering why is there so much hype around this room? Is it just that it's secluded and on the wall there are portraits hanging of poker legends? No, it's the history and aura of it. Nearly all the world's best have played exactly where we are now, Maybe Phil Ivey or even Doyle Brunson have sat in the same chair that I'm sitting in. Well, probably not Doyle. I imagine he scoots right up to the table and plays from there. You get the idea, though. And they just put so much care into every detail of the room. They're constantly updating it to keep it current with the times. Look at this phone, for instance. You might be thinking, hey, Brad, that looks like it's been there since the doors opened in the 90s. But no, these are brand new for this property. A couple weeks ago, they still had rotary phones in here. For real though, I've imagined this moment since I moved to Las Vegas in 2012, and this is special for me. To make things even more specialer, we have aces in this majestic place. Man, they look good. I'm in the hijack and I opened a 30. The small blind calls, he's in for a world of hurt. The big blind calls, whose world of hurt will be slightly smaller. We go three ways to the flop, in position, it comes jack 3-3 three, three with two diamonds. It's nearly as safe as it gets. The small blind, big blind both check. I bet 40 for value. I want hands like small and medium pocket pairs to stick around for at least one street. The small blind calls because he hates chips, perhaps he's more of a goldfish cracker guy. The big blind folds, we're heads up, the turn is the 10, it's another good card. The small blind checks, this time about 100, targeting hands containing a jack and flush draws. The small blind lets it go, and that'd be the only interesting hand that I get in this room. I moved to the main game in a different area outside of Bobby's room. I can't call it Legends room anymore, it just doesn't feel right. I don't like change. One thing that doesn't change is my hand. I've got aces again. I'm under the gun and I opened a 30. The cutoff calls. The big blind calls who just got caught bluffing in a previous hand. He likes to get involved. We're going three ways to the flop. The dealer puts out eight, seven deuce with two spades. The big blind checks. I bet 50. I wouldn't mind one color, particularly if the player is out of position. That's what we get. The cutoff folds. The big blind sticks around. We're heads up. The turn is the five of diamonds. 9-6 and 6-4 make the straight. And there are a couple of two pair combinations that the player might have. The big blind checks. Checking back is probably best since the cards out there are much better for my opponent's range than mine, but I've got such a strong hand and I could be up against lots of holdings that I'm ahead of, like one pair hands or flush draws, for example. I bet 120 for protection. There'll be so many bad river cards for me that it'll make it tough for me to get value on that street, so I figure it's better for me to bet here and check back most rivers if I get called. The big blind buys the ticket to take the ride. Dealer puts out the four of clubs. There are four to the straight, but at least the flush drop missed. The big blind knows it's a much better card for him than it is for me. He takes the initiative betting 300 because he knows I'm likely not going to be betting it. In a 2-5 game, I'd auto fold this. I should be auto folding this too, but I'm not holding the ace of spades, so I could still be up against plenty of missed flush draws. And I saw this guy bluff in a similar situation earlier. Plus, I'm a whale. I call. To no one's surprise, I'm beat. The player turns over 10-6 of hearts. He flopped a gutter while well, there was still a flush draw out there, turned an open ender, then drilled it, and got paid. Maybe I'm more of a goldfish guy myself. We're stuck a handful of cash. At least the very next hand, I get pocket aces again. This is super bizarre. All three times I've had the exact same suits. I probably only had aces back to back five or fewer times in my life, never in 510. My buddy's in the game. He opens a 30 in the cutoff. Small blind, who was the nemesis in the previous hand calls. 
I three bet to 150, hoping it'll look like I'm on tilt and want to come after people. That's not what it looks like to anyone. Both players fold. Back to back hands. First one. After adding on, I pick up a7 suited in the hijack. The player on my right limps in from under the gun plus one. He's the dude who cracked my ace with 10-6. I raise the 40 because he has too many Bradley dollars and I need to get some back. The button calls, he appears to be a good young pro. Under the gun plus one calls as well. Three of us are battling. It comes King Jack 7 with two clubs. We have bottom pair and a backdoor straight draw. Not a ton going on for us. Under the gun plus one checks. When he limp calls preflop, he shouldn't have connected well when two Broadway cards are on the board. There's only one possible combination of pocket sevens left, so I imagine he's gonna have a one pair hand at best. The button can have some slightly stronger holdings, but he won't have ace, king, kings, or probably even jacks, so the only other realistic strong hand that he could have would be king jack suited. I, on the other hand, can have all the sets and king jack combinations, so I take a stab at it betting 70, thinking I only have to get through the button, and under the gun plus one will be auto folding a lot. Turns out neither player wants to give up. The button and under the gun plus one both call. There are plenty of draws out there. I wouldn't be surprised if one or both players has one. The turn is the king of spades. Under the gun plus one checks. No need to bluff at this. I check. I'd love it if the button checks back and I somehow get to showdown with the winner. The button doesn't comply. He bets 120. This is a very small bet, especially considering how wet the board is. Hard to imagine you do that with trip kings against two opponents. Looks to me more like he's taking a tiny stab at it to potentially take control of the pot with a jack or a draw and to try to get other draws out cheaply now that the board is paired. I suppose he could still have king jack suited, but he might have raised on the flop and there are only two possible combinations of that. Under the gun plus one calls, I still don't think he's gonna have anything strong, particularly after calling this small bet. I could have the best hand, and I don't love the idea of calling. I see an opening to do something that I don't recommend doing yourself. I raised to 500. Let's see who really has anything. It wouldn't be impossible for me to play a full house or ace king this way, though more likely than not, I'd bet turn again rather than go for a check raise. This time, I'm hoping that it doesn't look like I'm on tilt and want to come after people, but that's kind of what's going on here. This should work fairly often, though. Even if someone is holding a hand like king queen or king 10, they're not going to love it. Either player's holding a jack, they'll have to give up, and all the draws will have to concede since they could be drawing dead. The button is tanking forever. He's good. I'm sure he suspects something could be up. Over a full minute goes by before he finally folds. It's a huge relief. The player I was most concerned about is gone. Under the gun plus one has had tons of time to think about his decision and isn't snap folding. Now the action's on him. That's scary. Eventually he folds two. We get an extremely risky bluff through. I don't hate my logic on it. Having a seven was kind of a key card since it cuts down on the full house holdings my opponents could have, the way it was played pre-flop, by 40%. All in all, we're a bit lucky to win it. Next we're in the big blind. Under the gun plus one opens a 30. The hijack calls, who's my buddy. The button also calls. We take a peek and see seven threes suited. It's easy to look down at this and say to yourself, it's only 20 more. I have two suited cards that can make a straight. I'm getting roughly 1.5 million to one on a call. I'm closing the action. Let's do this. It's not actually how you want to think about things. The problem with calling in a situation like this is that there's only one straight you can make and it'll never be the nuts. Plus, if you make a flush with multiple opponents involved, there's a good chance someone will have a better one if the pot starts getting big. And even if you are holding the winner, it'll be tough to get a lot of value from it when you're out of position. You should actually be playing tighter from the big blind when more players are involved. I'm aware of all this and disregard it completely. I call because A, it's more fun to play poker than it is to sit out and watch everybody else play. Two, I've never won a hand by folding. And C, Joe Hashem won the 2005 main event for 7.5 million with the worst version of this hand. If it's good enough for Joe, it's good enough for me. We're going four ways to the flop. The dealer puts out king five four with two diamonds and one spade. We flop a gutter with a backdoor flush draw. As you'd expect, not a ton going on for the classic seven three suited. I check. Under the gun plus one doesn't love his hand. He checks. The hijack bets 60. The button calls. Folding a gutter with a flush draw out there seems reasonable. I have to be honest, a big piece of me wants to raise here instead. I'm the only one in this hand that can reasonably have all the two pairs. I can also have a set of fives and fours. I only have three outs I'll be happy to hit if I get called, but if I raise here, I could potentially continue firing as a bluff if any spade, deuce, or ace comes on the turn. The problem is that the hijack and button could actually have strong hands. On the gun plus one, could even have top set, who knows. I end up calling to see if I can turn some equity. On the gun plus one folds. Three of us are continuing on to the semi-final round, and some equity we turn, my friend. The dealer puts out the six of hearts, we drill the gutter, changing our hand from one that plays about as good as the New York Jets to a hand that plays more like the Kansas City Chiefs. I check the trap, the hijack doesn't fall for it, 
he checks. I really don't want this checking around. It's all on the button. It's very much like MacGyver coming through in the clutch to save the day when times are tough. He bets 160. I'm ecstatic, but there are a ton of cards that I won't want to see on the river. I need to get as much money in now as possible. No messing around, I raised to 550. This could be an extremely big pot. The hijack folds, the action's back on the button. He doesn't look like he's going away. It looks like he's contemplating either a call or a jam. I have 1725 total in my stack at the moment, including the 550 that I put in the middle. The button has me covered. It doesn't appear to be sweating much. It looks like he's super strong, is counting his chips and eyeing mine. Remember how I mentioned, if you make it straight with 7-3, it won't be the nuts? That thought's creeping around in the back of my mind right now. Could be up against 8-7, but I'm never getting away from this if I get jammed on, even though we're both deep. Time's going by extremely slowly, then the opponent slides in this huge stack of chips and announces that he's all in. Oh. Adrenaline's pumping through my body as we wait to see the final card. I don't even know if I'm ahead, and if I am, I don't know what cards I need to fade. Please put out a complete blank, the river, is the Ten of Spades. It seems like a great card because no additional hands are beating me. I look over at the button. He seems to have liked the river as well. He turns over pocket fives from middle set. No good. I turn over this garbage hand that was somehow spun into gold. It's almost embarrassing to win with it. The button's decision to flat and slow play his middle set on the flop cost him big time. He's as cool about it as can be though. He doesn't seem phased by it at all. Really nice guy. After verifying the final count from my stack, the dealer pushes one of the largest pots that I've ever won at Bellagio my way. After getting stuck early on, we've got piles of chips in front of us. The stack's over 3,700. A while later, we pick up ace-king offsuit under the gun. I raise to 30. My buddy three bets to 90 in the cutoff. I don't like calling and playing out of position. I prefer four betting. I'm getting three bet after opening from under the gun though. That's a bold move from my opponent. He shouldn't be doing that light. He could have a monster. I call to see the flop. It's ace-jack nine with two clubs, but likely best with top top. I check to the pre-flop aggressor. He down bets to 60. It's an interesting sizing. Raising doesn't seem necessary. I call. I don't want to see any more high cards or clubs. The turn is the ten of spades. We pick up a gutter. Shouldn't have changed too much. I check. The cutoff doesn't love his hand. He checks back. It's very possible that he has the same hand as me. He's checking for pot control. He wouldn't do that with two pair or better. The river is the four of spades. It's a complete blank. I probably have the best hand, especially after it got checked back on the turn. At worst, I'm chopping. Queens probably can't call a bet of almost any size, so I can pretty much disregard that hand when I'm determining what amount I'd like to bet. King's unlikely and kind of in the same boat. I really want to get ace king off chop, so I settle on a bet of 500. It's a big over bet. I can have a ton of huge hands, including jacks, nines, ace jack suited, and ace king. He's not going to be able to call with any one pair hands. He folds quickly. Later, he tell me that he three bet with queen jack suited. I didn't know that was in his three bet range. Otherwise, I would have four bet for sure. That's it for the interesting hands that we played. We make a huge comeback to get all the way unstuck and book a nice win. Played for about five hours. I won 12.80. So a uh, good session. I was down 800 to start. Really, there weren't that many big hands. So uh, it'll be an easy vlog for me to edit, which I'm happy about that. And 100% of the time that I play session in Bobby's room, I win, which is really nice. So uh, that was a bucket list thing for me as a poker player. I've always wanted to play in there. Pretty awesome that I got a chance to do that tonight. And uh, good, good day, good night. Uh, overall. After losing roughly 187% of my bankroll on my trip to Florida, I've been running well for the most part. The next night, I get it in with Pocket Kings preflop against Ace King offsuit, and I hold to win a $3,000 pot. I wasn't planning on getting any footage from this session, but I book another solid win of $1,400. The night after, I run into Carrot Top at a bar. He talks with me and my friend for an hour and a half or so before picking up our tab. Try to refrain from saying anything negative about his appearance. He's actually a super nice guy and wasn't nearly as intoxicated as he might look here. He was just making a funny face for the photo. Good times hanging out with him. He was hilarious and really fun to be around. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to hit the like and subscribe button because it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. I actually don't have anything else to say other than that. Um, Good luck at the tables, hope you're staying safe, and I'll see you next time. That was weird, I should do it, I usually do it with my right hand. <laughs>